YouTube! Welcome back to more of me, random, ranting about Star Trek Discovery. Um, and yes, my channel is normally a gaming channel, but if you guys do want to stick around and watch some, game, um, some gaming stuff or some Star Trek Discovery rants, please stick around. I enjoy having you guys on the channel, for sure. Oh boy! <laughs> now, that, now that we have a nice recap of everything that went down in episode one, which is the first half of the pilot that we got to see for free on CBS, now we can get into the real lack of substance of the show that people have to pay for on CBS All Access. Oh boy. So, first off, Michael Burnham. Oh, Michael Burnham. I, I don't know if they intentionally told her she's playing a Vulcan. I don't know if it's bad directing. I don't know if it's a lack of understanding of anything Star Trek, but she's not a Vulcan. Why are you doing the raised eyebrow thing? Seriously, that's kind of a slap in the face to Spock. You're a human. You have no Vulcan DNA in you whatsoever. At least Spock was half Vulcan. You, you have the same sort of parents that Spock had. You know, your, your, your adopted father is Sarek. Your adopted mother is Amanda. There, there's no reason you should be wanting to try and be Vulcan so bad. <sighs> yeah, sure, she's smart, but there's no reason for her to be trying to be a Vulcan like this. Like, I, I know she wants to fit into her culture. It's just infuriating. It's like the show is trying to shove a main character down our throats and telling us that she's the best, smartest, most amazing, but doing nothing to show us that. They're showing this sort of smart-ass, know-it-all, hothead, spoiled brat little kid, and they're setting her up in this flashback that she is this hothead, spoiled brat little kid, and in, in the first episode where she's smarting off against the captain, shoving or getting shoved out of the way by Saru, she's the exact same person. She does absolutely no growth in seven years. Like, you're on a ship with humans for seven years, and they're allowing you to behave like this. Really. Are, are, we, are we really supposed to believe that that happens? You know, th this human has had no growth in seven years on a ship with humans, on a Starfleet ship with humans. And the fact that Captain Giorgio allows her to continue to be a know-it-all smartass is really inexcusable for a Starfleet bridge. Like, do you think Captain Kirk would put up with that for one minute? Do you think Captain Picard would put up with that for one minute? I, yeah. I don't, I don't think they would. I just don't think they would. <laughs> it's just inexcusable. And I'm sorry, it's frustrating. I don't like the character because of how... Just because of how forced of a character she is. I don't want to like her. I'm sorry. Oh boy. Next up. <laughs> the next problem I have with this episode. Five minutes of uninterrupted, dragging, boring, idiot Klingons. Oh boy. They talk slowly. They're uninteresting. They're boring. I don't care. The ship looks would be so great. It looks great if it were in Stargate. It looks like something that would be a great redesign of a Gwawl mothership or something. I'm a bit of a Stargate fan, so I kind of know what would work over there. <laughs> I don't like the Klingons in Discovery. They're just boring. You know, I already stated how hard it is to sit through their scenes. They're not interesting. I don't care about the war. That's the main problem with the Klingons. I just don't want to see them. Whew. Next up. <laughs> So, of course, we finally go, we're, we're jumping all over time in this episode. Um, I actually applauded when Burnham got sent to the brig. That was kind of nice. That was one of those, yay, I'll actually enjoy part of this episode. It was a nice bit of relief for this unlikable character. Um, of course, I have to talk about Ensign background character here. He, he's sort of put in to be this devastated by being an explorer, not a fighter, to, to make it matter, I guess. I mean, seriously, we had spent, like, no time naming anyone on the ship other than Burnham, Saru, and Giorgio, right? And a couple of the Klingons. One, one of the Klingons. I don't even think Vok has a name in this episode yet. That's, that's that white albino Klingon that's super important. But, but seriously, like, it, it doesn't matter to see somebody die if you've set nothing up about this person. He's just some background character. He might as well have been a cardboard cutout. Same thing with everybody else on the ship. And no offense to any of the actors. I, I think the actors are doing great with what they're given. But, you know, you can only do so well if you're given nothing to work with. I have nothing against any of the actors in the show. Even Sonequa Martin-Green. But 
seriously, you guys are not given anything to work with. <laughs> oh boy. But yeah, like, are we really supposed to care about this kid? I, I don't care about this kid. <sighs> Yay. So, of course, as the ship gets kind of blown up by the space orcs, I mean, Klingons, um, we, we see that Burnham, of course, has to be the smartest and bestest and smarter than the computer even. So she does her cute little logic puzzle to get out of the brig because she's being, you know, the, the, the whole ship around her is being destroyed and she'll pretty much die if they blow up any more than they already are. And I, I do like the little logic puzzle. I think that's kind of cute. I'm kind of super conflicted here. I want to hate her, but this is almost showing some of that, hey, she's actually kind of cool thing. But seriously, who does she think she is? Princess Leia or something? Like surviving in the back vacuum of space? Just, just, you know, flying through space, shake it off like nothing happens. <sighs> you, you kind of, you, you have something cool and then you destroy it immediately by... Nothing happened. She's just in the vacuum of space. Sure, she's just getting her eyebrow, uh, eyeballs frozen and her face is freezing. Nothing. Don't go to sick bay. Nothing. Oh, I did nothing to the shot again. <laughs> it just all went blurry for some reason to to make it interesting to show that she's a little fuzzy from being in the vacuum of space. I, I really wish they would have done some research on this. <sighs> But Burnham is fine, back to work like nothing happened, facing no consequences whatsoever, no confinement to quarters, no sit down and shut up, um, nothing. I get that the captain doesn't want her to die, they've been through a lot, but seriously, you screwed the pooch royally on this one, girl. You, you don't get to just come back to work after assaulting your captain. I don't care if you guys are kind of in this war situation. Picard would never put up with this. Captain Kirk would never put up with this. <laughs> And it really makes me have la very little respect for Giorgio that she is so lenient with this smartass. Like, I I've certainly had my, my fair share of talking to, talking to's at work situations. And I have definitely am kind of that smartass, know-it-all, unlikable person. I never had treatment like this. <laughs> Seriously, Michael Burnham. I don't get you. I don't get this show. But, you know, it's convenient. It's for the convenience of she's the main character, so we can't have anything happen to her yet. <sighs> now I need to get into some of the major plot problems in this episode. Okay, so... They have the bright idea to beam a warhead onto the dead Klingon to disable the sarcophagus, sarcophagus ship's shields. That's hard to say. They want to take Takuma a prisoner, and Burnham flat out says, We can't kill him. This will make him a martyr. You know, and, and that's a great idea. That's absolutely a great idea. Um, disabling disabling the shields so they can beam over is, is great. I, I don't have a problem with that. E even putting it on the dead Klingons so that they don't suspect and they don't see it, it. It's kind of a good idea. Except only these two beam over. <laughs> only the captain and Burnham beam over to the ship. These two scrawny bitches who don't weigh as much as one Klingon combined, and they're gonna go over there and take Takuma prisoner by themselves. Really? <laughs> without security, without a team of Makos. Hell, even Archer would have had a team of Makos on them. Like, and this is after Archer. They they know they they should have like at least some reserve. They should have, like, somebody on the ship who's security or something. Even on a science ship like the Shenzo, you would have some sort of security. <sighs> but, but, yeah. I mean, it's bad enough the captain's going at all. Like, we already know and have established that the captain really shouldn't be going on away missions. It's kind of dangerous. And the first officer's job is to tell the captain, hey, you probably shouldn't be doing this. And the captain's job is to be like, you know, I'm going to override you because I want to go on this mission. <sighs> but yeah, so the captain's taking somebody who just assaulted her, committed mutiny, and somebody who just survived the vacuum of space. This has probably all happened within maybe 10 minutes of real time. <sighs> so that plan works great for the captain. Nice. But, but we can't kill him, which is why our phase are set to stun. That would only make him a martyr, as we set it to kill and freaking kill him. 
I, I gotta calm myself down. I get so livid at this episode. <laughs> like, she she flat out goes from, I have my phaser set to stun, like a Starfleet officer would. You know, no, screw everything I just said. I'm gonna kill him. And th- there are some excuses that they, they set up in the show, which I can um totally kick in the balls right now and say that that's absolutely inaccurate. Like, Giorgio even um, has mentioned to Michael Burnham, hey, you're, you're probably sick from radiation, you probably aren't in your right mind, except that she's always kind of been a bitch. They set her up like that from day one in the flashbacks where, you know, she's wandering around the ship kind of smarting off to Giorgio seven years ago. They set her up like that before she goes over to the Klingon ship and gets irradiated. She's always kind of like that. You cannot excuse the fact that she's not herself for this. <sighs> Boy. But, you know, we can't kill him. It'll make him a martyr. <sighs> yep, so everyone's dead, Dave. Captain's dead. Takuma's dead. Even Captain Hollow, whatever his name was from that other ship we don't ever see again, is dead. You done messed it up, girl. They're all dead. But that's okay. This Klingon ship will be floating around unattended in Federation space for a while, you know, until it's convenient for them to show up again in the plot. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> you know, nobody probably sends any anybody to, like, to go salvage it or to go see what's up. Klingons don't send out any beacons for God knows how long. I'm, I'm sure, like, like they would do, they would just leave that ship floating around mostly intact with Klingons still aboard in Federation space, but... You know, whatever. And, of course, as we close out this lovely episode, we see Burnham's tribunal for assaulting her captain, getting her killed, starting a freaking war, mutiny, all that good stuff. Let's add in another charge for me being reminded of a show I'd much rather watch that has a much better use of that spotlight effect. But anyway, (laughs) thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for watching, guys. Um... If you want me to keep doing these, let me know. I'm kind of doing this for my own therapy reasons, and I really want to watch Babylon 5 now that I've seen that last shot. But, um, you know, watch Babylon 5. It has great characters, solid acting, great space battles. Um, Until next time, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys later. (laughs) Bye!